very different set of priorities and values. But it always entails a sweeping kind of rearrangement of the way that we view life and reality. And so you may find your calling this way. And a prime example of it that we find in biblical history would be in the life of a man named Saul of Tarsus. And so I want to uh, open up today uh, to his story, which we find in the book of Acts. Now, Saul of Tarsus is actually introduced to us for the very first time in Acts chapter 7, where in that story, that story where we're reading about a, a brave and, and outstanding follower of Jesus by the name of Stephen, who was mobbed and, and stoned to death as the first Christian martyr. And Saul was on the scene as a willing accomplice. And then in the next chapter, as, it, as the story continues, it says that, as Saul, that Saul approved of their killing him. And on that day, great persecution broke out, broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. All right, and then there, there are some, a couple of intervening stories. And then in chapter 9, it opens this way again. Meanwhile, it says, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if, any he, found, or if, that if he found any who there, who there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Okay, so we might wonder like why right why is Saul so driven here to terrorize people simply because of their religious beliefs and and we'll find out later that Saul is a zealot like he he is um, someone who kind of has the same mentality as Islamic terrorists today or at least some of them who sincerely believe that they're doing the right thing Saul was a person who sincerely believed that he was doing the right thing. His mindset was that, that he was protecting Judaism from this new heretical movement that had cropped up as he, as he viewed it. And while we may not resonate with you know, that particular part of Saul's story, there is an element to his story that is replayed in countless people's lives. And that's where you think that you're doing the very thing that you should be, but you're not. You think you're going down the right path, but you're not. You're going the way that the voices that you have let into your world have directed you. You're going the way that the circumstances and the events of your life seem to have pointed you, but it's not the right way. And then another motivation that we see in, in Saul's story here is that he was chasing success. We find that out about him later. He admits to that in his letter to the Galatians. He was chasing success. He was a man who <clears throat> had joined the Pharisees, who were the, the strict right-wing you know, part of, of the, the, the Jewish kind of structure of, of power. And, and so he had become a Pharisee. He had been brought up under the tutelage of one of the very prominent rabbis by the name of Gamaliel. And so Saul is an up-and-comer. He's an up-and-comer. He, he's a ladder climber. He's a mover and a shaker in Judaism at this point. And he is uh, among the influential elite in Jerusalem. And so for him, squashing this Christian movement, which they viewed as heretical, would have been a stepping stone towards him becoming even more of a household name and, and rising to the heights of success and, and influence that, that he aspired to. And in that, he is not at all different than so many people in our world today who are following what appears to be their path towards success and influence, whatever that may look like for them. Maybe you want to be somebody 
Like maybe you are driven for success. Maybe you're a person who's very ambitious and you kind of have your sights set on what you uh, are, are aiming for. You, you have high hopes for where you want to land professionally, academically. And, and so you've got some, some drive to you, perhaps. You know, when I was in college, uh, straight out of high school, I, I did my first couple of years, and then I dropped out of college to become a professional musician. Like, I, I decided that my path was to become a rock star, okay? I really did. And I, I really thought that this was my ticket. I thought this was what I was cut out for. Um, and, and as I looked around at my life, you know, as I looked around at the circumstances of my life, everything seemed to point me that way. You know, everything seemed to line up well for me. My, my mom was, was a pro-grade m- musician. Um, so I had music in my blood. Um, I, I had um, majored in music during my time in college, so I, so I was equipped well with that. Um, my two closest friends uh, were both musicians. One played drums, one played bass. I was a singer and keyboard player. So we started the band, and we started writing songs. I think we wrote some pretty good songs. Um, and, and we also had connections. I, I had really strong connections with an up-and-coming band named Pantera that was on its way to stardom. And, and so I, I just knew that we were going to get a record contract and that I was going to be touring the world. That's what I believed was my path, my purpose in life. But God had other plans. See, wh- whenever you have a plan, whenever you have a life goal and you're charging towards it, it's, it's important to, to kind of understand that whatever that looks like for you, whatever you have in your sights, you may have it all planned out. It may seem like um, everything is falling into place for you to pursue that path. Maybe it's already seemed that way and, and you're already well down that path. And probably there have been influential voices in your life that have helped to contribute to the shaping of your plan. There have probably been events in your life. There's probably been circumstances. There's been things that have happened in your life. Things that have come into, into place that have seemed to funnel you down that path that you're on and that you're charging towards. And you believe that's your purpose. That's your, your plan. That's your, your goal for your life. And you may be right. You may be. But another possible scenario is that what your life has mainly been about up until this point is actually a big detour around what you were actually created for. Okay? And I'm not just talking about profession here, I'm not just talking about vocation. But what you've been believing to be the purpose of your life may actually not be. It may be something else. You see, we all see through the lenses that we have been given by life and by, you know, our our upbringing and everything that's happened to us. So, So we're all looking at life through these lenses that we're wearing. The problem is that sometimes the lenses we've been given are distorted. The glass is distorted. It's warped. And we're seeing things incorrectly. We're, we're, what we're seeing isn't true. What we're seeing isn't actually reality. And, and it's possible for then us to, to get off track and have a distorted view of what our life's purpose is. And so in Saul's story, we see an example here. I mean, it's just a, a vivid example of how we can be convinced that we are on the right track when in truth, our lives are a runaway train going the wrong way down the track. And in Saul's case, the effects of that were extreme, weren't they? I mean, people were dying. People were going to prison because Saul was on the wrong path. Now, I know that's extreme, but you know what? When we look around you know, ourselves, when we look around at people around us, when we even maybe look at our own lives, it's not hard to see how the things that many people are chasing after that they believe will be their, their key to success are actually things that are not taking them any place good. 
Now, there are, there are plenty of businessmen and businesswomen out there who have left a wake of destruction in their path. Shredded relationships, broken families, ruined finances. You know, there, there's, there's been all kinds of damage done by people who are ambitious and, 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 and heading, you know, hell-bent down a path at, towards success. And so if, if you're drive is to succeed. If that's to you, like I've got to succeed in life and you're, and you're understanding success in the ways that the world defines success, then it's really not a big step from that to ruining other people's lives in order to improve your own. It's not a big step. And I, I know there, there are varying degrees, you know, to which we may get on the wrong path and, and, and varying degrees to which being on the wrong path may cause effects that are, are not particularly what we would hope for, that, that would not be good effects, right? So on the one end of the spectrum, you know, you may, by being on the wrong path, you may, like Saul of Tarsus, leave a whole lot of pain and hurt behind. So the price of success is just way too high. You're hurting people. You're, you're hurting your family. You may be hurting yourself. On the other end of the spectrum um, of being on the wrong path, you may simply finally, you, know, you, you may spend your whole life you know, going down this path, doing this, and get to the end of your life and look back and just come to the realization that you really don't have anything to show for it that really matters. And you're just left sitting there thinking, you know, what did I do all that for? What, what, what value did I add to anybody's life? What value did I add to the world? See, it may be that the life we are living is not the life that we were created to live. It's, it's something far less. But we're oblivious to it, like Saul was. Life seems pretty good. Life, life seems comfortable. Feels like we're on the right path. You know, there's nothing that we're seeing that would immediately make us believe that we needed to make any kind of big change in our life. And we may not be completely off base. Maybe we just haven't connected what it is that we're doing with how God wants to use it to actually bless people and glorify him and, and promote the values of his kingdom. Maybe we just haven't made that connection yet. But sometimes what it takes in order for us to, to, to change the trajectory of our life is a pivotal moment when God gets our attention. A pivotal moment. And let's see how it went down for Saul of Tarsus, okay? Chapter 9, beginning in verse 3. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days, he was what? He was blind and, and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man named, from Tarsus named Saul, for he is what? Praying. He's praying. So in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to what? To what? 
to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, and placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may what? See again. See again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. And all those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among all those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? And yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is what? The Messiah, the the deliverer, God's anointed. I guess you could say Saul got a wake-up call, right? I mean, this, this moment in his life would be forever etched in his memory. It completely changed his entire trajectory. And it's an experience that we call conversion. And see, when you think about this this scenario, all that time that Saul was causing, the pain that he was causing, there was this heroic calling that was waiting for him. But he couldn't hear it. He couldn't hear the calling because he didn't know Jesus. And so he didn't know the voice that was calling him. Could it be that you don't yet know and recognize the voice that's calling you to your purpose? Could it be that all this time he's been inviting you to your calling, to your purpose, but but you just haven't been able to recognize that voice. You see, to to find your calling, you have to come to know the one who's calling you. You gotta know him. See, when Jesus is calling you, you you don't don't want the caller ID of your phone to say, unknown caller. (laughs) And so, you know, you know what you do when you get unknown caller, right? You hang up, you know, you just decline the call. Right? You don't want that to happen to you. you so Jesus, he, he wants to, first of all, introduce himself to you so that you know who he is. And it may not happen as dramatically for you as it did for Saul of Tarsus. He may not knock you off a horse in the middle of the road, but that's okay because he has lots and lots of ways of getting our attention. And when he finally got Saul's attention, do you remember the question? that Saul asked in verse five, he said, who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? See, this is the most important question you will ever ask. Who are you, Lord? And until you find the right answer to that question, you will never know the meaning of your life. You'll never know the true purpose of your life. You will spend your entire life wandering around, wondering why you're here. Jesus wants you to know him so that you will recognize his voice when he calls you. He wants you to know that it's the voice of the one who loves you infinitely. It's the voice of the one who died for you. It's the voice of the one who rose again from the dead and is interceding for you. Jesus used a metaphor in John chapter 10 of a shepherd with his sheep. And he talked about how the good shepherd calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. He goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they what? Yeah, because they know his voice. See, Jesus wants a relationship with you so that you know his voice and so that you recognize it when he is calling you and you can follow his lead. 
But it all starts with that critical question. Who are you, Lord? And that isn't the kind of question that you can just sit on indefinitely and just become comfortable saying, I don't know. So you need to know. You need to know the answer to that question if you're ever going to find your life purpose. And so you need to diligently seek the answer to that question. Saul spent three days blind, didn't he? Following this experience, which, which I think is clearly just a physiological way that God impressed on Saul the fact that he had been living his life in the dark. That, that he had been blindly charging down the wrong path all this time. I think that's, that's something that probably is the case for so many of us. If only we could experience something like that to realize it. But you know what? In the middle of that crisis, in the middle of his confusion, when Saul's like, what in the world is happening here? What did he do? He spent time fasting and praying. In other words, he gave God access to his heart during this time of confusion and and trying to figure out what in the world just happened. Who did I just meet on the road? He's fasting and he's praying. That's how you begin to discover who he really is. You have to spend that time with him. You have to open up your heart, give him access to your heart. And then when Ananias came, shows up, and he tells Saul about Jesus that he met on the road, and he, he prays for him, and he, and he speaks the name of Jesus over Saul, Saul's like, the lights come on, right? The lights come on for him. He suddenly realizes what's going on. Why? Because he had already opened his heart. And he not only regains his vision, he was seeing things spiritually a lot clearer than before. But, you know, it's, it's hard to come to grips with the fact that you're maybe living your life in the dark, isn't it? That's not an easy realization to come to. I mean, it, it really requires a lot of humility, requires a lot of, of honesty with yourself to be able to own up to something like that. And it may take fasting and prayer for you to come to that realization. Yeah, you know, it, it is hard, but you know what else is hard? Living your life in the dark. Yes, it's hard to come to the real, to realization that you're living your life in the dark, but it's also hard to live your life in the dark. So choose your heart. It's going to be hard either way. It's only when we come to know Jesus that we come to know our truest self, and that's that's what's important for us to get here. If we want to know ourselves, we have to know him because he's the one who gives us the meaning of our lives and the purpose of our lives. He's the one who knows who we were meant to be. And so it's truly a conversion experience that we need here. And we move from seeing Jesus and seeing ourselves and seeing our own lives one way to seeing them another way. Conversion. And when we have that kind of conversion, then my friends, we are on the threshold of living a heroic life and finding the true purpose of our lives. See, we may find, like Saul, that what we thought was our calling was actually the wrong path. Turns out we were were going the wrong direction. In Saul's case, I wouldn't say he had missed it completely. I mean, he was a man who lived from his convictions. He he was a man who who never did anything halfway. And, And he was just kind of born to be a crusader for a cause. The problem was that the convictions that were driving him were mistaken, and he had the wrong cause. So what he needed was... He needed a realignment of his convictions to truth, and he needed to find the right cause. And so that's what Jesus came to do for him. And Jesus tells Saul, I'm going to tell you what you must do. And and when Saul actually retells the story in chapter 22, he recounts how Jesus said, you will be told all that you have been, what? Assigned to do. You're going to be told all that you've been assigned to do, Saul, 
So what does that mean? It means Jesus had a plan for Saul. It means that he had an assignment for his life. And he's saying essentially to Saul, if you want to discover what your life is really about, you're going to have to trust me because I'm going to lead you down that path. I'm going to take you where you need to go. So the question is, what is God's assignment for you? What is his plan for you? If you'll follow his lead, if you'll open yourself to his guidance, he will take you there. Promise you that. You know, this is such a huge moment in Saul's life right here, isn't it? I mean, this is, this is where everything kind of hangs in the balance, right here in this moment. His entire legacy is hanging in the balance. What is he going to do? Is he going to listen to this new voice and accept all of its ramifications? Or is he going to shut it out and keep living life by his own plan? What is he going to do? He is hanging in a moment here between, between life as it has been and the life that's being offered to him. And he has to make a choice. See, and you might find yourself today even, or at some point in the future, you may come to a point where you also are in a similar moment here and you're looking back on the life that you've been living and you're also looking ahead at this unfamiliar territory that Jesus is now pointing you down and you kind of have to decide, what am I going to do? Am I going to stay back here, you know, where I've been? Am I, am I going to stay with the, the comfortable, unfulfilling present? Or am I going to stretch towards a compelling, fulfilling future that Jesus is pointing me down and that I was created for? That's a crucial moment. And that's an unsettling place to be, isn't it? Sometimes, you know what? Sometimes... Being unsettled is the best thing that can happen to you. Just ask Saul. That's when we have the potential to grow, to become the person that God dreamed of. And you know, actually, the more comfortable we are, the less we grow, right? And that's why sometimes God has to push us out of that comfort zone so we can grow. But with that uncomfortable prospect of making a major change and, and pursuing a new calling came a very comforting promise. Verse 17, Ananias went to the house, entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, brother Saul, the Lord has sent me so that you may see again and be what? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Wow. That's the comforting promise that comes along with this whole unsettling, uh, disorienting experience that he is facing of changing his entire trajectory and, and the calling of his life. But here's a promise. Saul, the Holy Spirit is going to fill you and you'll not be alone in this. See, anytime that we, that we realign our lives to God's plan, we never do that alone. We never do that on our, on our own. We never do that by ourselves. He's always with us. Conversion is not just about being changed. It's also about being filled. Being filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, that filling is the key to changing. You're not going to do this on your own power. You're not going to do this on your own smarts, your own wisdom, your own ideas. You're, you're going to do this on his power. And, and it's through that relationship where where you develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit who has filled you that is a relationship of trusting, listening, and responding. Trusting, listening, and responding. You know, to me, the most encouraging part of Saul's story and his conversion is that no matter how long and how far and how hard you've been charging down a path, God makes it possible to change courses. Isn't that encouraging? See, Saul's legacy wasn't finished here. 
His his bloody rampage through the Christian community didn't have to be the final chapter of his legacy. He didn't have to let that be the way his story ended. In fact, get this, all of that harm that he caused didn't disqualify him from letting the Holy Spirit fill him and redirect him to his life's calling, to his new legacy. And you know what? Neither do yours. Neither do your failures disqualify you for the calling that God has for you. You know what? Decades later, as Saul neared the end of his life, now known as the Apostle Paul, yes, Saul became the Apostle Paul, he wrote this, 2 Timothy chapter 4. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me what? The The crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to who? To who? To all? Did you say all? Did you say all or did you say some? Okay, all. I just want to make sure. That I heard you right. You said that he said that God will award the crown of righteousness to all who long for his appearing. How many of you long for Jesus appearing today? Oh, wow. I know I do. Come, Lord Jesus. It's like my, one of my most common prayers. Come, Lord Jesus. Save us. Right? So if you long for his appearing, which also means you long for his kingdom, which also means you want your life to be about his kingdom, then you're going to also be able to receive the crown of righteousness. You're going to be awarded what he wants to reward you with at the end of your life. Listen, this is a picture. This this is a statement of a man who is looking back on his life and he is feeling the satisfaction of a life well lived. This is a man who is thinking about a legacy that he has written and he has built and he knows that it's a good one. And he's proud of it. Not in a kind of, you know, self-righteous kind of pride, but just a, I, I know that I've lived the life God wanted me to live. And, and I wonder, you know, if, if Saul had, if he had stayed on the course like he was on before, the original course, the original path that he had taken to destroy the church, if he had stayed on that course... If he had dismissed Jesus' call to him, if he had decided that he had gone too far down that path to turn around now, I wonder how different his reflections would have been at the end of his life. And I also wonder how different, how much poorer the world would be if Saul never became Paul. Listen, my friends, only you can live the life that you were created to live. Nobody can live it for you. God had plans for you before you were born. And no matter how your calling may come, whatever context it may come, it's up to you to rise and answer the call. You have to make that choice. So let me ask you, are you open to God's call? Are you open to God's dream for you? Will you let him lead you into it? Even if it requires that you have to completely change directions. See, God may be calling you to cancel your current plans and to devote your one and only life to what you were actually created for. And again, To discover your purpose, you must come to know the one who's calling you so that you can recognize his voice and follow his lead. So the next step for you and for me is this, to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ. There needs to be a moment for each one of us where we intentionally decide I am surrendering my life and my will to Jesus so that I can receive 
his life and his will. There needs to be a moment when you make that decision and you call out to him and you surrender your life. Have you done that? I got to, to help a couple do that just yesterday. Jeff and Nicole, and it was such a beautiful moment yesterday for them. Powerful moment. And you could have that moment today. I just want to ask you, if you would, to bow your heads with me in this moment. God, I want to pray right now, my Holy Father, that you would speak through your Holy Spirit to the hearts of every person in this room and every person who's listening online. God, I pray that you will convict us of your love for us, your purpose for us. God, we don't want to miss it. And so right now, there, there may be someone right now who needs to surrender their life to Jesus. And I just want to ask you to pray. Say, Jesus, right here and now, I want to give you my life. I want to take you as my Savior. I need your forgiveness for my mistakes, my failures, my self-will. And instead, in their place, Lord, I want to receive all of the good things that you want to give me. Your grace, your mercy, your presence, your love, hope, and the purpose of my life. Please reveal it to me, Lord. Show me what you want from me. Show me how you want me to make a difference in this world. Open my eyes like you opened Saul's. God, may the, may the scales fall from our eyes today. May blind eyes be opened. May fear be cast out. May faith rise to the surface. May lives be redirected by your Holy Spirit today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if that is the decision that you made today to surrender your life to Jesus, then you need to follow that up and confirm and, and, and demonstrate that decision in baptism like Saul did, as we read in chapter 9. After coming to this realization, he got up and he was baptized. To say, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving my old life behind and I'm being raised up out of the waters of baptism to live a new life, a life that's directed towards the purpose that God has for me. And so if you today want to give your, have given your life to Jesus, you want to be baptized, please check that on your Connect card and, and let's, let's talk about that. But when I say surrender your life to Jesus, I don't just mean once. I mean daily surrender your life to Jesus. And, and I, I have given you over the course of this series a number of next steps to take. And I'd like to just briefly call them back to mind and ask, how are you doing with these? Because once you surrender your life to Jesus, there's some, some steps to take to help you find that purpose. I, I, one of those steps was in crisis, open yourself to God's call to action. Another is that when you see an important need that isn't being met, step up. Meet the need. Another is ask yourself, what just isn't right and what does God want me to do about it? Another is to ask God for wisdom and to seek godly counsel for the position that he's placed you in and the influence you have and how to use it. And then last week's was to be a willing volunteer. To have that volunteer spirit, Lord, here am I, send me. So I want you to think about, how are you doing with those next steps? Is there one you need to take today? Take it. Don't just let this go by. We're, this is your life purpose we're talking about. So take a step. Another thing that you can do that I talked about last week is to come to the workshop that Skip Vaccarello is going to be uh, leading us in uh, here in a, in a very short time, a couple of weeks coming up on a Saturday morning uh, at the Hyatt Place. And it's going to be uh, an opportunity for you to really sit down and think this through with some guidance to give you more clarity, some practical steps that you can take to think about who do I want to become, which really is who does God want me to become, and thinking about 
all the things that go into that and, and, and then walking out of there with some intentionality and intentional plan of some things that you're going to put into place to move you that direction. I hope that you'll join us for that, that uh, seminar and that you'll go ahead and get uh, signed up for it. You know, when we think about Jesus' suffering, we, we tend to think about Jesus' suffering ending at his death, right? Like he, he, he went to the cross, he suffered everything that happened leading up to the cross. He was crucified, he hung there for all those hours until that last breath that he took. And we think, well, his suffering ended there. But you know, years later, Jesus appeared to Saul of Tarsus on that road and he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Jesus was being persecuted even then. Why? How? In what sense? Because his people were being persecuted. And Jesus so closely identifies with us, his people, his church, his bride, his spiritual body, that when we are being hurt, when we are suffering, so is he. And that is a testimony to his love for us and his identification with us. And so as we come to communion today, I just want you to think about how honored that we really are, that he identifies that closely with us, that what happens to us happens to him. And let's go ahead and let's take this bread remembering what the Apostle Paul wrote about how as we observe communion, we need to discern the body of Christ. The body of Christ, both his physical body that hung on the cross for us and the spiritual body of Christ of which we are now a part. So let's eat this bread, reflecting on the value and the beauty of that reality. Let's drink the cup of juice representing his blood that we all share. Because Jesus loves you so much and he cares so much for what's going on in your life, he wants to meet you right where you are and he wants to bless you he wants to provide for you he wants to protect you he wants to heal you he wants to give you hope he wants to give you encouragement he wants to give you guidance whatever it is you need and so this is a time of prayer time that we take to let ourselves be in his presence and pray and we want to offer prayer for you over you today so my wife, Michelle, and I will be down here at the front and floor. You can come for prayer. We would love to pray for you. We also have two of our wonderful new prayer ministry team members who are up towards the back of the room. So you can go to either one of them if you choose. But this is a time for us to respond in prayer. And you can come or go up there. Either way, let us pray for you.